Hi, everyone. My name is Ariel. Uh, I am from the John Germain Library, um, and we're so happy to have the Hamptons Observatory here with us today and William. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Hamptons Observatory is a nonprofit organization that has served the community since 2005. Its mission is to foster interest in science, particularly astronomy, through educational programs such as this one. Lectures, star parties, portable planetarium shows, and other events are held throughout the South Fork. And it established the first astro astronomical observatory on the South Fork on the campus of the Ross School in East Hampton, complete with Long Island's largest research-grade telescope. And these facilities will soon be accessible over the internet to students, teachers, researcher, researchers, and the general public. Hampton Observatory offers all of its programs free of charge to encourage participation, regardless of economic status. And for further information or to join the Hampton Observatory's email list for news and event notices, you can email hamptonsobservatory at gmail.com. And I think at the end, I'll probably add that to the chat for all of you to see. Um, and also before I introduce William here, just to let you know, there is another event that's coming up. It is Astronomy in Ancient Egypt, and that's being done through Guild Hall and Hamptons Observatory. I'm gonna add the link in here for everybody, if my computer will, will work. And um, that one is gonna be on 7 p.m. on Wednesday, October 20th. So add that to your calendars. And then uh, now I'd like to introduce William, and then I'm going to fade into the mist. Um, William is the Hamptons Observatory Senior Educator. William Francis Ta Taylor has been a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador since 2014, lecturing about the universe around us and sharing his love of the heavens by giving guided tours of the sky through telescopes. And he is a lifelong resident of East and um, Long Island. So take it away, William. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone at John Germain uh, for co-hosting this event with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, um, as you mentioned, we, we do a lot of these events. Um, we, we try to reach a broad as audience as possible. So I really appreciate everyone who came out tonight. Um, uh, so without uh, too much ado, I will uh, start by sharing my screen and I hope that everyone can see. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to start with. Okay, um, so uh, tonight's talk is about the autumn sky. Um, so uh, tomorrow, I believe, is the actual official autumn equinox, the beginning of autumn. Um, I, I have felt the change in the air already the past couple of weeks as we went from a summer, which was very muggy and, and hard to see any constellations at all, to a really crisp and beautiful fall. Um, we had a, a full moon uh, just last night or the other night before that, um, and it's been beautiful uh, stargazing um, th throughout this month. So I'm really excited for what the rest of the fall has to bring. Uh, one of most people's favorite seasons. Uh, it's very crisp and nice here in, um, in the East Coast. In the East Coast, we got a lot of muggy summers because of being right next to the ocean. So when September comes around, it becomes a much nicer experience for us amateur and professional astronomers alike. Um, but around the world, there are uh, all kinds of traditions uh, that happen around the September equinox, um, just like there are for the other um, major astronomical holidays of the year. Um, uh, one that's um, really interesting is from Japan. It's called Tsukimi. Uh, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Tsukimi. Uh, it means moon watching. Um, and uh, there's a lot of traditions that are associated with it. It's very uh, ancient part of Japanese culture. Uh, one is that people make these balls of rice called dango. Um, they, they plant different kinds of grass around their homes and they watch the moon. Um, here is a poem uh, by a Dogen, a Zen master, uh, who, like a lot of people in Japan, would, would watch the moon and think philosophical thoughts. Uh, one of them was that although golden waves are not calm, the moon lodges in the river. In refreshing air, it shines on high, and all the ground is autumn. Reed flowers on the Wei River, snow on Song Peak. Who would resent the endlessness of the long night? Uh, so it's a beautiful time of the year to go out to spend the entire long night looking up at the sky. Um, and there is a lot to reward moon gazers in particular, not just tonight, but um, on November 19th is a special date. Um, so I would encourage people, if I mentioned a date and you're interested in watching, make, make a screenshot or just jot a note down. I can try to share it with you afterwards. This is going to be a partial lunar eclipse that's going to be visible to most everyone in North America. 
Um, and even though it's a partial lunar eclipse, it's really almost a full total eclipse. It's just going to miss the a vast little bit. Here's a picture of a similar type of eclipse um, from a few, year, a few months ago in Australia. Um, one thing you might notice that I always like to look for when I see the full moon is the outline of this rabbit, this two ears here, um, and he's pounding some rice. Um, so it might sound strange, but it's a part of a lot of cultures from East Asia and also from uh, ancient Mexico to see a rabbit in the moon. And once you, once you become aware of him, it's really easy to see him. He even has a little miniature moon behind him, which is the crater called Maricrisium. Um, so it's, it's fun to look for him instead of the usual man in the moon because the rabbit is a very vivid shape. But on the night of this total eclipse, uh, the moon will become much darker, uh, much redder. You'll see a lot more stars than you normally can during the full moon. Um, and uh, it's a great night to go out and take a look. Um, so um, one thing I will say is that uh, just as a rule of thumb, when something cool is happening in the sky, often it's cloudy. So uh, we don't we don't always know when when we'll get good weather. So uh, I encourage people every night that you see stars go out and take a look. Um, so uh, what is so special about the equinox? This is a simulation uh, for the spring equinox, but the same thing happens on fall equinox. Um, if you if you pay attention to the shadows of things, you'll notice something a little interesting that the shadows, for instance, of this cone always move in a straight line. This only happens during the equinoxes. So late September, late March, the rest of the year, the shadows of things make um, these kind of looping shapes called hyperbolas. Um, so uh, this is an example of an ancient Greek sundial. Um, and by studying the shapes that shadows make and paying attention to them, you can figure out what day, what time of day it is. And you can also figure out what time of year it is. Um, and so uh, it's one of those things that all of us see every day, but don't necessarily pay attention to. But it's a, it's a fun way to tell what season you're in. Another way is to pay attention to where the sun rises and sets. Um, so here's a picture from Italy of different times of the year, different sunrises in the equinox. The sun rises directly in the east, sets directly in the west. Other times of year, it's a little bit further north and further south. Uh, now, a lot of us who spend most of our days indoors, um, aren't necessarily tied to nature the way that people used to be. You don't even necessarily know which way is east and west, so it's a bit hard to uh, discern um, the equinox from that. If you live in Chicago, uh, you're lucky because on this time of the year and also in late March, on the March equinox, the sun rises and sets directly down the ends of these avenues because Chicago is on a perfectly east, west, north, south grid, unlike Manhattan. In Manhattan, the, the, if you look at a map, the whole island is a little bit tilted off of the north-south axis. So there's a similar thing in Manhattan in June called Manhattan Henge, which I've seen and it's, it's really cool when the sun sets right down the avenue. But in Chicago, you get a more uh, 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 astronomically interesting one right at March and September. Here's an example of why this is the case. In uh, March 21st, September 22nd on the two equinoxes, the sun rises directly in the east, sets in the west. You can imagine the entire sky turning around, rotating around. I have a little model that explains how this happens. Uh, it's called an uh, armillary sphere. And it's a sort of miniature planetarium that shows you how the sky moves throughout the day. There's a part of the sky, if you could see it, that just rotates in place. And stars, for instance, in this part of the sky near the North Star never set, never rise. But the sun is usually further south. and um, since that's during the day, of course. During the equinoxes, the sun is right on the equator, right between the North Pole and the South Pole of the sky. And so we get exactly 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours a night, equal night, which is what the word equinox means in Latin. Um, in the summertime, we get a lot more daylight than we get sunlight because this circle that the sun makes spends more time on the day side of the planet. Um, in the winter, we get much less sunlight. So it makes a shorter shadow. And also the sun rises and sets in different places throughout the year. Um, so this is kind of an old vision of the universe. Um, it's uh, what's called the uh, helio, uh, the geocentric model. And even though it's not actually true that the earth is the center of everything, uh, it is a convenient uh, way to think about how the sky moves. 
uh, because it seems to us that, the, that all the stars are kind of painted on a certain sphere that's rotating around. And you get a different view of this sphere depending on where you're standing. So someone in New York sees different stars than people further south in Australia, for instance. Um, this idea of two spheres, one sphere for the earth and one sphere for the sky is a really ancient one. And here's a, a painting I saw yesterday at the Metropolitan Museum uh, in New York of, of six Tuscan poets, um, including Dante and Petrarch. Um, and right in their hands here, we have a globe of the earth and then a globe of the constellations. So a great way to learn about the constellations, is kind of see them painted on a sphere, just like different countries are painted on the globe to get a sense of their relative positions. Um, here is a beautiful example, also from the Metropolitan Museum of a celestial globe. Um, and this one had clockwork inside of it. So it rotated to simulate how the stars and the sun move around during the sky. Um, so as we all know, the, the sun makes one little trip across the sky during the day. But over the course of a year, it goes on a long trek around the entire sky, traveling at a path called the ecliptic which passes through 12 constellations called the Zodiac. So right now, the autumn equinox, the sun is passing through the constellation Virgo. So here you see the sun on its movable track. Uh, a few uh, months ago, a couple of weeks ago maybe, it was in the constellation Leo. Um, and as it goes along, it'll pass into Libra, then to Sagittarius. Um, so the actual path that the sun takes through these constellations has shifted a little bit since Roman times. So uh, most people uh, today still have at least heard about the idea of astrology of predicting facets of your personality based on what month you were born in. It's a little bit offset from when um, uh, uh, that tradition started. Um, so nowadays we're just ending the season of Virgo, I believe in astrology, but in astronomy, we're just entering the constellation of Virgo as the sun moves through the sky. Um, uh, but uh, another thing that's very interesting about this is that um, it changes the constellations we see throughout the year. So uh, naturally we don't see any uh, constellations uh, that are too close to the sun because the sun's light blinds them out. So if I wanted to go see Virgo tonight, I'd be out of luck. Uh, Virgo is right there in, in the midst of all the sunlight. But on the opposite side of the celestial sphere, uh, there's a whole set of constellations I think of as the fall constellations. So for instance, Pisces, which is where the sun is during the March equinox in the springtime, Pegasus, Aries, and uh, especially two that we're gonna talk about tonight, Capricornus and Aquarius. So these are zodiac constellations. So this is uh, part of the path of the sun. Um, now Capricornus is uh, a challenge to see because uh, it's one of the dimmest constellations um, that are famous. and it's mostly famous because of where it is. It's where the sun and the planets, planets pass through. But it's a really interesting constellation. And it's a very weird constellation too. I, I remember when I first became aware of Capricornus as a child, I thought it was really strange because uh, it was half goat, half fish, which isn't like anything else I, I know of from the real world or from mythology. Um, but even to uh, the ancient Romans and, and Greek people who, from whom we receive a lot of this tradition about the constellations, this was an ancient, ancient constellation even in their time and also mysterious uh, because uh, the oldest records of this constellation are as far removed from the ancient Romans as we are from the Romans ourselves. So uh, they have their origins in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, so there's a constellation Capricorn in the night sky right now, Aquarius, another kind of strange constellation, a man carrying water, usually depicted as pouring it. Um, his name means the water bearer. Capricornus means the goat with horns. Um, but here's an image of something very, very close to the modern vision of Capricorn, um, and it's a sea goat. So the head of a goat, the body of a fish, um, and it's a Neo-Babylonian um, uh, uh, seal, um, a stone seal, a Chalcedony seal, um, written in Neo-Babylonian script. Um, and there's lots of artistic depictions of these type of mythological creatures. So here's another one, a goat fish from the city of Assur in uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Um, so uh, this constellation has its origins connected with Babylonian Sumerian mythology. Um, and um, they're all connected with the god Enki or Ea, who was the god of the sea. Enki is the Sumerian name. 
So that is the most ancient language that we know about from that part of the world. Um, and it was ancient even in the times of the Babylonians who came later and spoke a different language called Akkadian. Um, but they, they worshiped the similar pantheon and Enki was the god of the sea. Um, and he was also the god of craftsmanship. He was a very clever god. And there's a lot of fascinating, interesting stories told about him. Um, and a lot of it we know partially uh, through images like this and also from texts. There's a lot of texts from the ancient world um, that survive to tell us the stories of the constellations and where we get them from. So Enki himself resembles um, in a lot of his depictions uh, the god, the constellation Aquarius. So a lot of the constellations that are near Aquarius in the fall sky are related to Enki. Um, so uh, here you see him again um, with these kind of merman-esque creatures below him, half men, half fish. Um, and if you look around, you can find pictures of him with something very much like Capricorn, half goat, half fish, um, which was an icon of, of Enki or Ea. Um, so um, here's a, a closer picture, might be a little hard to see. I realize that because uh, <laughs> uh, these are impressions made from a wax cylinder. Um, but um, you can see all, already like uh, Enki here is carrying water and it's spilling on the ground, much like the constellation Aquarius. Here is Capricorn, um, uh, in a Capricorn-esque uh, figure. Um, and these, these iconography, this iconography goes back to 2000 BC, almost to 3000 BC. It's very, very ancient. Um, and um, like I said, it was ancient even in the times of the Greeks and the Romans. Um, and they inherited it and made it part of their tradition. But its origins are as old as anything we know about human history pretty much. Um, so one thing we know about the uh, uh, ancient people of Mesopotamia is they divided the sky into three different regions. And each was secret to a different god. So Enlil was the god of the sky. Um, Anu was the god of the air, and Ea was the god of the sea. So Ea, Ea's region of the sky was everything to the south, uh, which makes sense if you think about the geography of Iraq, which is where modern, which is where the Mesopotamian civilization was. The only sea close to them was south at the Persian Gulf. Um, so uh, those constellations, which we still have today, we have almost all the same constellations that the ancient Mesopotamian people had. Um, the constellations to our south usually have a watery theme. Um, so the constellation Hydra, which is a sea monster in the springtime. There's a constellation called Argo Navis, which is a great ship that we see in the winter. Um, and then a lot of the constellations that we're gonna be talking about tonight, Capricorn and Aquarius are all water related in some way. Um, this is a text called Mulapin. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that close to correct, but I hope so. Um, and it's a, a, a compendium of information about the Babylonian constellations. And some of them, of course, were different from the ones we know today, but many uh, were pretty much the same. And that's a fascinating thing to, to me to think about, because uh, if we think about the reality of what stars are, what constellations are, um, stars are constantly in motion. They're moving very, very fast through space, this huge galaxy, which if you could see from the outside would resemble something like a tornado or a whirlpool or a hurricane, it's a constantly in motion but our lives are so short in comparison to this motion that we only see uh, the same static picture of the sky, not only through the course of our lifetime, but from generation to generation, going back as far as we can go back in human history and written human history, of course, um, to the Sumerians, the ancient Egyptians, they were looking at a very similar set of constellations that we see today. They organized it differently mentally uh, from one civilization to the next, of course, so that in ancient China, there was a very different set of constellations than we have here in, in the West. But um, many cultures inherited the Babylonian tradition, including the Greeks, including the Indians, and through them, many other civilizations. Um, so if we try to look at the constellations uh, for the first time, a lot of us, uh, to be honest, are sometimes disappointed because we don't see these really uh, vivid uh, pictures that we get from artistic depictions. Um, and in fact, Capricornus is one of the dimmest constellations in the zodiac. It's very hard to make out. Um, to me, it looks more like a mouth, like a smiley Cheshire cat type of smile, or possibly a boat. A boat is a good compromise because of, it matches the, uh, the watery theme of the goat, the sea goat. Um, but with a little bit of imagination, you can picture this being the head of the goat 
and this being the, the aquatic tail. Um, that's how it's usually depicted in art. Um, it's a very uh, easy to find constellation right now because it's host to the two, two of the brightest planets. So if you go out tonight and look towards the south, you're bound to see both of these planets. They look like stars, um, but the brightest one is Jupiter on its left and then Saturn to its right. Um, so these planets wander through the constellations of the zodiac. Uh, this one over here towards the right looks like a teapot. That's the constellation Sagittarius. Um, the constellation to the left of Capricorn is Aquarius. Uh, so I like I like this constellation quite a bit um, because it looks to me very much like what it's supposed to look like, a, a man running, carrying a bucket of water and drops are falling out. Um, so remember that this constellation though is supposed to be from the most ancient traditions we know about an actual depiction of this god Enki or Ea, the god of the sea. And then um, below that is a constellation called Pisces Ostrinus, which means the southern fish. So there's a lot of seafaring connections here with this part of the sky. But to be honest, it's also one of the dimmest parts of the sky. So uh, if we try to look for these constellations on a moonlit night or in a place with a lot of light pollution, we're probably not going to see very much. It takes a little bit of patience to kind of connect the dots uh, between dim stars of Aquarius, the dim stars of Capricorn, not to get them mixed up. But uh, through practice, you can definitely learn to uh, make your way and navigate this, this watery part of the sky. So here is a map of Capricornus, uh, according to um, the modern boundaries of this constellation. Um, and there's a lot to talk about, um, even in this one small, not particularly bright constellation. Um, there's a couple of interesting stars um, that you might see. Uh, one of my favorites is a star called Al Jedi on the top right of this constellation. And that's because it's a double star when you look at it. It's not always obvious at first, but if you look at it and you have reasonably okay eyesight, you can see that there are two stars very close to each other in the sky. Uh, one is called uh, Al Jedi Primus. The other is called Al Jedi Secundus. If you are fans of the book Dune by Frank Herbert, you might have heard of Jedi Prime, which is the home of the evil Harkonnen family. <laughs> that, that might be taking its name from this star. Um, however, uh, these two stars, even though they seem to be very close together in the sky, are actually very, very far apart from each other. One is 100 light years from us. The other is 800 light years from us. So it's just a coincidence that they seem to be very close in the sky. They just happen to be on the same line of sight. Um, but another another object you can look for in Capricorn, assuming you have a pair of binoculars, you don't need much more than that, is a little fuzzy spot called M30 here on the map. So M30 is a shorthand for Messier 30. Messier 30 is an object in the night sky, which is a huge cluster of stars. I would say that there are at least 100,000, well, several hundred thousand possibly stars in this part of the sky, um, clustered into a little ball. And if you have a, a binoculars and you look at it through your pair of binoculars, you'll probably see something that looks like a fuzzy spot, like a fuzzy star. If you have a telescope, and this is a, a sketch by um, Michael Vlasov, who used a 10 inch Newtonian telescope, a kind of telescope that's not uncommon, and we have one at the observatory. Um, it's, um, it's possible to see a lot more detail. You can see the individual stars popping out of this little fuzzy ball in the middle. If you have access to the Hubble Space Telescope or something, you have a much different view. Here's uh, how impressive and uh, mind-blowing this object is. It's uh, ten th tens of thousands of light years from Earth. I'm not sure of the exact figure, uh, but it's very, very distant. Um, and it's composed of, like I said, most of these galactic clusters have hundreds of thousands. Some of them have up to a million stars. SA30 is not even the brightest one in this part of the sky. Um, if we look nearby at the constellation Aquarius, so here's a map of Aquarius again. Uh, there's a few other globular clusters. There's one called M72, right on the border between Aquarius and Capricornus. And here's a picture of M72 uh, through, again, a very large telescope, not one you can readily get your hands on. Um, one thing to take note of is the different colors of stars. Uh, a lot of these stars look bluish. Some of the stars look reddish. Um, most of the stars look white. The colors of the stars tells you a lot about the temperature of the star. It tells you a lot too about the chemical composition of the star. And um, once you research this field, you learn about the age of the star, its evolutionary history. Stars like human beings have a lifespan, although a star's lifespan is usually measured in 
uh, millions to billions of years, depending on what type of star it is. Here's an even brighter globular cluster called Messier 2. Um, and it's one of my favorites to look for through binoculars. Um, I will just give you a brief little rundown of how you find things like this in the night sky. Uh, one thing that you need to do first is to learn the constellations to try to just pick one constellation. Don't try to do them all at one night, of course, but learn one constellation, try to become reasonably familiar with what it looks like and try to draw it both from looking at the picture and then try to draw from three hand. The more you do this, the better you'll get a sense for its geography. Um, and for instance, in Aquarius, the part I'm circling here is the head of Aquarius. Um, and, and, and this artist's rendition, this art comes through us uh, by H.A. Ray, who was uh, the author of Curious George. Uh, but he was also an avid astronomer and drew amazing constellation uh, drawings that helped us out a lot and learning the constellations. Um, the head of Aquarius, if you follow, it looks a really interesting little pattern. It looks a bit like mm, a little parallelogram with an eye in the middle. If you follow the line of these three stars backwards, again, by its whole length, you get to the star called, you get to this fuzzy spot called M2. Easy to find with a pair of binoculars. Um, there's another even brighter one up here in the constellation Pegasus called M15. All of these cobbler clusters, we're seeing them at a one snapshot of their lives. Uh, they're really old. Um, most of them formed very shortly after the Big Bang. So they're about the oldest structures that we, that we see, apart from the galaxies themselves. Um, so um, here's a simulation of what they might look like for the very long term, um, following a globular cluster or some other type of cluster. Um, from the time of its origin until it evolves into a big ball of stars. Um, now, uh, something that's very interesting about living in a globular cluster is the entire sky around you, if there was a planet and one of these stars would be absolutely full of the most brightest and beautiful stars, um, much brighter than we can imagine here on Earth because our sun is relatively isolated compared to the stars that live in the globular cluster. You might've just seen two stars go shooting away from each other. Uh, if you try to interact and simulate what it's like for millions of objects like stars to orbit around each other, it becomes very chaotic. And um, it's from time to time, the stars come close enough to collide. And that's the only way that new stars are generally formed in globular clusters, because these globular clusters are outside of the mainstream of the galaxy. We live uh, somewhere in this huge disk that we call the Milky Way. Here's the little yellow dot. I'm not sure if anyone can see this, but it represents the sun. And on the map I showed you earlier of Aquarius and Capricorn and Pegasus, there were a lot of globular clusters in one small part of the sky. And that's not a coincidence because most of the globular clusters are centered in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so um, learning astronomers, when they began to puzzle out where the globular clusters were in the sky, map them out, they realized that they were very concentrated around the constellation Sagittarius in the area around that. Um, a very cl clever astronomer deduced that that was probably the center of the Milky Way galaxy and that we were pretty far off from the center. We were about halfway to the edge. Um, so that's a little example of what we call faint fuzzies in amateur astronomy. It's um, types of objects that don't necessarily overwhelm people visually when you see them, even through a big telescope. But when you understand what they are and have a little bit more familiarity with their really bizarre and interesting natures, they become more impressive. But something that does not take too much background at all to really be wowed by are the planets, especially when you view them through a telescope. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them. In particular, the planet Jupiter, the brightest planet in this and the night sky right now after Venus sets. Um, it pays to watch Jupiter every night. You never know what's going to happen. Here's what happened a few days ago. So I don't know if everyone saw that. I'm going to play it again. Uh, about Right about here, uh, in, a, in a few seconds, you'll see a white flash. Uh, so what happened is that an asteroid or a little piece of a comet, we don't really know, something on the small side, size of a bus or so, crashed into Jupiter at such an enormous, unbelievable velocity that it caused an enormous explosion. Uh, tremendous damage to gas and clouds and other things in Jupiter's atmosphere, but uh, it was very brief and it left no trace that we have so far seen. These types of uh, asteroid impacts on Jupiter were not known uh, about until 1994, uh, when a pair of astronomers named Carolyn Shoemaker and David Levy discovered a comet 
that was destined to crash into Jupiter. Uh, but in recent years, since people have had video cameras attached to telescopes watching the sky 24 seven or whenever you can during the nighttime, uh, you can uh, see these kinds of asteroid impacts at Jupiter and also our moon um, pretty often. You can also see one of the moons of Jupiter here and the shadow it makes. Another thing you can see in this video is how wobbly <laughs> and uh, difficult it is to see things in space because our own atmosphere, it's like we're at the bottom of an ocean or we're looking to the bottom of a pool. Everything is wobbling around because of light being bent in all kinds of different directions. Um, if you have a really fantastic telescope and you know what you're doing, uh, like the uh, show photographer Damien Peach, you can get really fantastic images of Jupiter these days um, and you can see its moons. Um, and uh, occasionally you can see a great red spot, but you don't need an enormous telescope to see this great red spot. It's visible every few hours as it crosses the face of Jupiter. Um, to, for a vision of what the two big gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, look like through a, a more ordinary uh, telescope, like the kind that I have, um, here is a great picture by the photographer Xin Qian. Um, and you can see um, Jupiter and its four moons uh, pretty much any night that you look for it. And you can also see stripes across Jupiter. Those are the um, big cloud banks here. Um, they're called the um, longitudinal, oh, sorry, latitudinal clouds because they follow the lines of latitude on Jupiter. Um, and here you can see Saturn and its rings, which are super impressive. Uh, anytime you can see them, uh, it looks astounding. And people, that's one thing that changes people's lives is when they see Saturn and its rings for the first time through a telescope. You can also see the um, moon of Saturn, Saturn's biggest moon called Titan. Uh, now, this is a, a, a pretty accurate portrayal of what Jupiter looks like through an ordinary person's telescope that they might have. But this is a very unusual time uh, when Jupiter and Saturn were extremely close to each other, close enough to see uh, through the same eyepiece at the same time. This only happens once, I would say, every couple hundred years. Uh, and this happened last December, uh, the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, which some of you may remember seeing. Uh, Saturn, uh, like Earth, has its seasons. Um, here's a photo montage by Damien Peach again, uh, showing how uh, at certain times of Saturn's year, we see its southern side. Other times, we see its northern side. And then uh, occasionally, uh, every uh, 15 years, I think, uh, we see a perfectly edge-on view of its rings. And I've never seen this myself, but maybe the, the rings almost disappear to a person with a telescope because we get them edge-on. And these rings, as wide as they are, many, uh, many thousands of uh, miles, I'm not exactly sure of the exact width of them, they're very, very thin, just uh, a couple tens of meters maybe. Um, so they're very easy to lose sight of when you look at them from the side. Um, so uh, a year on Earth, last a year, of course, uh, 365 days on, on Saturn, a year last 30 years on Earth. So it's very slow moving. There's two more planets out there that are gas giants that you can look for, Uranus and Neptune. They're really hard to see without a really big telescope. Um, I mean, you can see them in any kind of telescope, even in binoculars, but to see any details, tricky. If you have a 10 inch size telescope or more, you can sometimes see Neptune's moon, one big moon called Triton. Now, if you're interested in looking for Neptune, uh, this is a good time of year to do it. Uranus and Neptune are both visible near the constellation Pisces um, in the fall. Um, what you need to do that is a really good map, of the night sky. And I recommend using an app that you can download on your phone. There's a lot of different kinds of uh, star maps, um, but they really help you get a sense of what is in your sky right now, depending on your location. And you can actually compare what you're seeing in the sky with the constellation map in your hand. And that's really changed astronomy for a lot of people. Uh, otherwise, you can print out a map at home and try to compare. It's a little bit trickier. You need a red flashlight, so you don't um, damage your eyesight. Um, there's, uh, in addition to Neptune, there's another uh, former planet, I would say, uh, formerly considered a planet object called Pallas, which was the second asteroid discovered after Ceres, which is the largest asteroid. Pallas and Ceres and Pallas were discovered at the very beginning of the 1800s. Um, and they were first thought to be planets because they moved like planets, but they were clearly much, much smaller. And now we know that um, these objects are just a few hundred miles across or so. Um, Pallas being one of the biggest asteroids in the whole solar system. Uh, it's very 
safely away from us. It orbits between Mars and Jupiter. Um, but it's uh, interesting to look for uh, because if you have a pair of binoculars, uh, you will and you and you find it and you succeed in finding it by comparing it with star charts that you brought along with you. You'll see it move from night to night quite a lot. Neptune also moves. And if you have a pair of binoculars or even just a small telescope, that's probably all the detail you'll be able to see. But because Neptune is so much farther away from Pallas, it moves very, very slowly. Um, so another planet uh, that's out there um, that you can see in the immediate evening after the sun sets is Venus. It, it, sh it sets shortly after that. Uh, Venus is, is a very beautiful planet, um, at least from a distance. Um, it's about the same size as Earth. It's a little bit closer to the sun. It's perpetually shrouded in clouds. So there's no details that we can really see. This picture here is from a, a space probe that flew past Venus. But um, if you try to look at Venus through a telescope in the evening, it's a little bit disappointing. Um, and that's because Venus is so bright, it's kind of halo light around it, kind of blocks you from seeing much detail about Venus. It's also low in the horizon. Uh, which is usually a bad place to look for anything with a telescope because there's so much refraction in the atmosphere. Uh, so one thing I like to do is to challenge myself and try to find Venus in the daytime. So uh, uh, it's really hard to do uh, because it's a tiny little dot in the sky, but you can actually see Venus any day it's out there. If it's a clear day and you know exactly where to look, it's visible in the daylight. Um, there is a famous story of I think Napoleon giving a speech one day and just happening to catch his eye on Venus and it startled him because it just hangs there like a star in the sky, but during broad daylight. Um, that being said, it's, it's very dim <laughs> with the sun out, so it's hard to see. Uh, one thing that I like to do is to wait every month until the moon comes very close to Venus. And it's not too hard to find the moon in the daytime if you know where, roughly where to look. So uh, here's a certain date to note down if you want to try this for yourself. October 9th, so this is around 3.30 in the afternoon. The moon, a crescent moon, will pass very close to Venus, and you can find it first in binoculars, and then you can probably see it with your naked eye. Uh, one thing I would strongly suggest is moving to some place where the sun is not, where you're in the shadow, so you're not seeing the sun. You don't want to ever look at the sun through a pair of binoculars even by accident. But it's perfectly safe to, of course, look at the moon during the daytime through a pair of binoculars. And if you do, we'll see a crescent moon, and below it, a little bit closer to the horizon, you'll see Venus. Um, now, if you have a telescope, you can even look at Venus through a telescope during the day, and it's a lot more rewarding than trying it at night. Um, and if you look at Venus during the day through a telescope, you will, on this particular date, see half of Venus. So like the moon, Venus goes through phases since it's closer to the sun than us. Uh, the other planets further away from the sun, we only see their sunlit sides. Um, if you look at the inner planets, Venus and Mercury, you can see them go through phases. So um, going back to the constellations that we were talking about earlier, Capricorn, Aquarius, and their southern neighbor, the southern fish, right down here, being bathed in the waters of Aquarius, is an interesting star called Fomal Hout. Um, and one thing that's very interesting about it is it seems like a very lonely, isolated star because it is the only bright star in this part of the sky um, in the fall. The, the rest of these stars are really dim, I have to say, um, <laughs> compared to uh, the winter stars like Orion and some of the southern uh, the summer stars. Um, but uh, it's not too hard to find right now if you can see Jupiter and Saturn easily. They make a little triangle with Fomalhaut. And Fomalhaut is pretty bright, always pretty low to the horizon. Um, now, uh, through an ordinary telescope, it's a really bright star. It's very close to Earth. It's about 25 light years away. Um, so relatively speaking, that's close to Earth. That's still a tremendously far distance. Um, but um, at Fulmahat, it's a very young star too. So our star is, Sun is about uh, four and a half billion years old, give or take. Fulmahat is just a few million years old. So it's still in the process of forming. Now, if you look at Fulmahat through a infrared telescope, like we have some in space, you get a much spookier impression. So this is what Fulmahat looks like in the infrared. A lot of people have compared this to the Eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings movies. Um, it's surrounded by this big disc, and this disc is dust um, because Fomalhaut, again, only recently formed. When our solar system formed, it was full of dust, um, full of all kinds of debris that gradually has cleared out, but not completely. 
Omaha has got a lot more of it. Um, there is an interesting story with Omaha and its possible planet um, that disappeared. Um, so this is kind of a bummer story uh, because when uh, this uh, planet was discovered, it was called Fulmahout B. Um, and it was discovered around 2004. Uh, astronomers took pictures of it uh, for a few years until 2012. There's another picture of it here. Um, and it lo definitely looked like a planet. It was moving around Fulmahout. Um, and this was the first interstellar planet that was discovered. I mean, an extrasolar planet, a planet traveling around another star that was visually seen through a telescope. If you uh, are interested, um, I can tell you a little bit more about the history of extrasolar planets, but they weren't discovered until the 1990s. And they're usually discovered through a sort of indirect way of seeing how they tug on the star through their force of gravity. Sometimes they pass in front of the star, causing it to dip a little bit. So uh, when astronomers discovered this object, they thought, hey, here's the actual first visual confirmation of a planet. And it was assumed that this planet, which was called Fulmahout B, and was later given the more formal name of Aegon, another ancient Mesopotamian god, um, the, um, with the with a aquatic and uh, aspect, I suppose. Uh, uh, but um, this uh, this planet Dagon slash Fumal um disappeared around 2012. We got much fainter, and it was also very uh, struggling. Uh, were difficult for astronomers to confirm that it existed because every time they would try to make a dedicated search for it in the infrared, nothing would turn up. Um, so um, what seems to be happening is that Fulmaha B is not actually a planet after all. It seems to be a cloud of dust. Um, so this is a uh, model, just an assumption of what might be going on, uh, that back in 2004, uh, Fulmaha B was a lot brighter uh, because it was a very dense cloud of dust and that as time has gone on, it has drifted apart. But it's a still a very interesting uh, story because what that means is that sometime in recent history, uh, not that long before 2004, there was an explosion, possibly an uh, impact between two different objects um, in the orbit of Fulmahout, um, and that we are kind of seeing the debris of this as it gradually uh, lies apart. So our solar system is so old <laughs> that most of these exciting worlds and collision type of events happened a long time ago. Um, and we see the uh, aftermath of them. We see the uh, fossil remains of these events, but we don't see it in person uh, live, which is a good thing because if it happened to our planet, it would be very bad for us. Uh, but uh, through other solar systems that are much younger, uh, we still see these planets colliding with each other uh, constantly. Um, I shouldn't say constantly. This is this. We don't know how common of an event this is, or what the actual explanation for Fulmaha B might be. Um, so that's one reason astronomy is really interesting. Uh, a lot of things, discoveries are made that are then retracted. There are a lot of debates based on pretty limited data. We're trying to figure out things from uh, trillions upon trillions of miles away, so it's not always clear what's going on. Uh, but this definitely uh, started to look out for in the fall sky. So. Uh, Another uh, object to look out for, uh, a star that I, has a kind of a spooky nature, is this star here called Algol, uh, which is a uh, star from the constellation Perseus. And its name means the ghoul or the demon in Arabic. Um, and that was probably a clue that people in, in ancient times were uh, baffled by its behavior. Every couple of days, it disappears almost, becomes much, much dimmer. Um, and that's because it, Algol is actually two stars orbiting around each other that eclipse each other from time to time. And sometimes the bright one is eclipsed by the dim one. Um, so when this happens, it's really interesting to look out for. I put a couple of dates in from the Eastern time zone where these happen in our evening sky. Um, they're all in October. This happens every uh, three days basically, but um, we don't always see them because they're mostly in the daytime. If you uh, go out for instance on October 5th um, at 1013, you'll see algal very, very dim. And if you wait over the course of an hour, it'll come back again to its normal full brightness. The key to appreciating this event is to see Algol in its, its normal brightness. It's a pretty bright star. Um, what you can do is uh, look for the constellation Cassiopeia, which I've circled here, with my pointer. Um, follow some of the stars down to the constellation Perseus, which is a pretty bright constellation. A bright star called Mirfak, which is always really bright. Algol is a little less bright than that, but still comparable to this star over here in Andromeda. But when it goes into its 
dimmer phase, it becomes really dim indeed. It becomes like one of these stars here in the foot of Perseus. So becoming acquainted with the normal picture of algal and then comparing it on these nights when it's having an eclipse is a really dramatic event. Uh, eclipses of our sun and moon, like the uh, lunar eclipse we're going to be getting in November, are pretty rare. But algal goes into an eclipse every three days. So uh, it's a, a really interesting thing to see an eclipse happening uh, hundreds of light years away and around another star. Uh, going back to this map again, uh, one other thing you can look for in this night sky, and this will probably be the last thing I talk about, is uh, a really dim patch, which is hard to see. And, and I again, I am uh, advertising the fact that if you live in a suburban area, if you live in a light polluted area, if you live in a city, you're probably not going to see it at all. But if you live, like many of us do, live in the east end of Long Island, if you live by the sea, if you live somewhere that's further away um, from big shopping centers and so forth, you can see this. It's the most distant thing you can see with your naked eye. Start by looking for the constellation Cassiopeia, which looks like a W on the, the right hand most triangle. Follow it straight down until you get to something that looks like this. Um, part of the constellation Andromeda, and it's called the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, and here is a much nicer picture of it. Um, this is taken by a photographer named Sebastian Boltner. And the Andromeda Galaxy is a beautiful close sibling of our own Milky Way galaxy. It's the closest large spiral galaxy to the one that we live in. This is what our Milky Way would look like if we could somehow get outside of it, most likely. Um, our Milky Way um, has two satellite galaxies, two suburban galaxies that orbit around us called the Magellanic Clouds that we can never see from New York. But if you ever are in Australia, Chile, anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, you can see them. Likewise, Andromeda has two uh, suburban <laughs> galaxies orbiting around it that are um, satellite galaxies. Um, and looking at this, I find very breathtaking because you can get a sense of what a uh, hundred billion, close to a trillion stars must look like. And the light from this galaxy is reaching us after traveling for three million years or more. Um, it's really interesting to me uh, just to think that um, even though this galaxy is so far away, we can still, on any given night in the fall, receive photons that have traveled all the way from the star, and they will land in our eyeballs, and we will have a, a sense of vision because of this. So think about what that really means. That means that in this galaxy of almost a trillion stars, there are countless atoms giving off electrons, countless charges running through objects making them vibrate in electromagnetic waves and somehow these electromagnetic waves traveled all through space to reach our eyes. Um, so this is our Milky Way galaxy and this is what this type of galaxy looks like if you're inside of it living in the middle of it. Uh, we see it edge on because we're inside of it again uh, and uh, throughout the fall um, you can still see this beautiful vision of the Milky Way starting in Sagittarius moving up across the sky I um, mean, it's probably the most beautiful thing uh, in astronomy to me, just to see that Milky Way galaxy. So I will uh, end it there. And I am happy to take any questions that people have. Um, I also have a, a planetarium program. Uh, I can fire up if anyone wants to look for any particular objects in the night sky. Um, I'm just, I'm back to tell everyone how they can ask questions. So uh, everyone, if you want to, you can try to raise your hand in chat. Um, I believe if you go either to, if you click on participants or you click on chat, there should be like a reactions thing and it'll have a little hands you can raise up and then I'll unmute you if you have a question um, or you could send it in chat um, or, you know, also if you want to, you know, watch the planetarium thing, you can also tell us that in chat and I'll pass it along to William. We did get one question. I got one question actually, William, while you were talking, it was if you had any recommendations on a basic backyard telescope for kids. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm biased because I've always used the same type of telescope, pretty much the same telescope since I was, I don't know, uh, in my twenties. Uh, that was, uh, 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 it's called the Dobsonian telescope. Um, and I like this type of telescope because it's very, user-friendly, it has a very simple type of base and um, it doesn't require much of a learning curve to get it set up. 
Um, and but one thing that you get for Dobsonian is you uh, you you make a trade off. You don't have such a fancy mount that it won't turn uh, with the sky. It won't let you really do photography. But you can get a pretty big mirror, which gives you the most impressive uh, visuals, in my opinion, um, for a pretty reasonable price. Usually for around two hundred to four hundred dollars for a pretty good one. Um, and uh, if you get something for a kid, it uh, depends on how, how old he is, but something like, or she is, of course, uh, it could be like maybe a, a six inch telescope or four inch telescope is not too heavy and um, probably a great place to start. I was muted. Um, <laughs> someone here raised their hand, so I'm going to ask them to unmute. And uh, just as Abcat here, you should be able to ask your question, I think, now. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Hi, yeah. So I have a couple of questions. Um, well, number one, I really like that uh, slide that you had on the spring equinox. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a homeschooling mom and I homeschool my, my daughter and we've been following the spring equinox and we were looking for a really good map and that looked like a really good map for following the spring equinox. Is that something that we could get a copy of? Of that was slide. it the, the video that you're talking about that shows the shadows or was it? Um, yeah, one of the shadows. I like the map. It was pretty interesting. Um, let me um, let me see if I can go back and you can tell me which one you're, you're referring to. Okay, um, another question. Yeah, of course. What was your other question? Um, so going back to the, um, I think it was at the very beginning on that spring equinox. Uh, yeah, right there. Number mm -hmm. eight. Yeah. That's okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is a picture of a sundial from ancient Greece. And um, sundials are, are a fascinating way to learn about how the sky works because you yeah. can build one yourself and you, and you can really just follow the shadow. And one thing that is, especially if, you have, if you're a teacher or if you're just a curious person, one thing I like to do around the equinox is find something that casts a shadow, like a pole, your house, anything, and just leave little stones on the ground where you see the shadow at any given moment. This is if you have a pole. You just put a little stone, anything to mark where the shadow is. And then if you come back in an hour or even less than that, the shadow will move and you put another stone down. And if you well, do this for equinox, you'll see like a line that, that's yeah. made, a perfect line. I like that map. It looks it looks perfect for, for following the spring equinox because right around March time is when we start following it. And it's mm -hmm. like a certain time frame. And it's really fun to, to follow the, the map. And I, I like how that map is because that looks really awesome. But anyway, next to, to, to my next question, um, so following the, the, the star, of uh, I forget the name of it, but you also called it, uh, Dragon, Dagon? Yeah, Fomal Hout, maybe. Yeah, which mm -hmm. is actually, it's in the Bible. It's a Bible name. Mm -hmm. It means, you know, fish God. Um, mm -hmm. but what I found interesting about that, which I wanted to ask you is I noticed that you showed the picture of something that was exploding and hitting Jupiter. And that was mm -hmm. an explosion and it like went away really quickly. Yeah. But this, this, you know, you said it wasn't really a star. It was kind of like dust. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said it could be possibly an explosion, but it's still like lingering. Mm -hmm. So how is that being illuminated versus what we saw with what was hitting Jupiter? And it was very quick. It illuminated and then it disappeared. So I'm curious about the difference between those two. Sure, so that's a great question. Um, so yeah, in terms of what hit Jupiter the other day, and this happens every few years, people pick this up, was uh, it's pretty close to like a bomb going off. You know, this an object traveling very, very fast, hits Jupiter's atmosphere, explodes with the force many, many, many times greater than any atomic bomb that people have ever made. It, and it um, it's, it's bright enough to see from Earth from that far away. Um, now, um, so that's kind of just illuminating itself. It's giving off its own light. For something like uh, what we were looking at around the star Fomalhaut, which was possibly a planet, possibly a dust cloud, we're still not really sure. Um, assuming it's a dust cloud, it might've been something a bit like a comet. So a comet is really just a cloud of dust coming off of, a, of an object. Like that's usually, if you think about it up close, it's like a, like a snowball. Um, and it's giving up steam and stuff as it melts, as it comes closer to the star. Um, so what the current theory about Fomalhaut is, not Fomalhaut the star, but Fomalhaut B, it's a possible planet. Um, so the current thinking is that um, two objects 
things maybe on the size of Pluto or something like that, collided it to, into each other um, and created a huge cloud of debris around them when, the, when this happened. So um, when you look at it and this dust cloud is very, uh, still very compact, it's still being lit up by that star, the, the star nearby, which is Fomalhaut, um, which is a really bright star, so it illuminates the dust around it in the infrared. Uh, but as that as that object kind of expands, the, the dust becomes less and less bright. So that's why people think it might have disappeared or faded over the last couple of years. Okay, okay, I'm understanding now. So there, the the other star behind it is what's illuminating it and causing exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's, it's in like orbit around it. It's in orbit around a, a star. Jupiter, which isn't illuminating like like the star is. Okay, I understand now. Thank you for that explanation. I You're appreciate welcome. that. Thanks for your question. Um, so we have a bunch of questions in chat. Um, so I'm going to try to go through them quick. So one person just um, asked, I'm, I'm guessing they were talking about your last picture. Was that M31 in Andromeda? Yep, that was called, that's another name for it is M31, Messier 31. It's also called the Andromeda Galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then Barbara asked if you can spell the name of that telescope you recommended and also if a six or 10 inch telescope is a good starting size. Well, 10 inch is a great telescope. It's more heavy. <laughs> so, but uh, I, 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 the only downside with these really big telescopes is that they, they do get heavier and sometimes it's a dis disinclination to, to lug it around. But it's, you, you'll definitely be uh, blown away by it if you, if you use one. Um, I don't know. When I started off, I, I started off with an 8 inch telescope, which was which pretty big, but not too big. Um, so you can, you can, you can always, um, if, you, if you find a telescope store, for instance, you can go there and you can ask them to try out one of the telescopes to see what it's like. Um, but um, um, that's a really hard question. I, it depends on um, on so many things, but um, not, not all of us live in a place where we can really go stargazing in our backyard, which would be ideal. Uh, I don't live in a place like that because I have so many trees around my house, so I have to travel. So a big part of uh, astronomy is, is, is relocating myself to a place where I can actually see things <laughs> and then going there. So um, I, I need to I need to have something I can transport. So a six inch is really easy to transport. Uh, as the spelling of that is um, so it's named after a person whose last name was Dobson. I'm afraid I can't remember his first name, but he was a really interesting uh, man who uh, invented it, a new kind of telescope. Um, so it's D O B S O N I A N Dobsonian. And that's just what I happen to use. Um, there are uh, other types of telescopes out there that also have their advantages. Uh, one question I, I just got as a direct message, so I'll, I'll just bring that up, is why is Jupiter so bright? Um, that was from Julia. Um, and uh, one thing I just want to say is that right now, Jupiter is Jupiter's always really bright because it's the biggest planet in the solar system. But this month in particular, um, Jupiter is as close to Earth as it gets. That's called opposition. Um, that's when um, the planet, Jupiter, and the sun are in opposite parts of the sky. And that only happens when Earth gets as close to Jupiter as you can get. So it's, it just happens to be a little bit brighter than usual then. Um, we also, we got a lot. Someone does want to see the planetarium. So I'm not sure that's up to you if you have the time. We also got a question about, you mentioned app maps. And if you had any recommendations about an app they could use. Sorry, so I just loaded it up. I don't, I don't know if everyone can see this. That's why um, maybe some of you can. You can. I, I've had mixed reactions to it. <laughs> But um, it's, this is a program you can download for free. It's called Stellarium, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. And you can download it from most computers. Um, and it lets you, it's like a planetarium in that it shows you what the night sky looks like uh, tonight. So right now I'm looking towards the south of the planets Jupiter and Saturn. And I can also bring up constellations, which makes it a lot easier to see what part of the sky we're looking at. So here you can see Sagittarius, is where the uh, center of the Milky Way is. Um, and you can also adjust it to different times of night. So if you um, are interested in what it will look like at a certain day in the future, or just what it will look like a couple of hours later, you can, you can change the time. So uh, there's a lot you can do with this. And this is a totally free program. So that's one I definitely recommend people using. Um, if, you are, if you have an iPhone or Android or something, you can look in your app store and see a lot of different types of ones. And, I would just get one of the free ones first. And then if, if you really become interested in astronomy, then you can reach out to me and I can tell you some personal recommendations. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, this is uh, called Stellarium. 
Um, and it doesn't always transmit very well via Zoom, um, but you can download it for yourself and explore the night sky. It's a, it's a really great way to get familiar with what constellations are gonna be up there tonight. And you can also um, uh, um, zoom in on different parts of the sky. So for instance, here's the constellation uh, Orion, which you can see if you get up very early in the morning um, right now. And if you zoom in on the sword of Orion, you can see the Orion Nebula, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, objects you can see uh, through a telescope or binoculars in the sky. I mentioned the Andromeda galaxy before. It's also easy to um, see through binoculars and really amazing through a telescope. Um, and that's over here in the constellation Andromeda. So this gives you a, I'm not sure how you guys are seeing things on via Zoom, but it gives you a much uh, nicer view than you, <laughs> than you would actually see unless you have a really large telescope. But uh, um, even through like a, a, a six inch telescope, a 10 inch telescope, you can see the really bright core of this galaxy and you can see its neighbor galaxies. Um, someone also asked how um, this compares with the app Skyview. I'm not sure if- uh, um, I think I've heard of Skyview, but I, um, I, I'm not super familiar with it. I, I often use one called Sky Safari which there's like a free version and a pay version, but I do the free version is great just for seeing what's up there. Um, someone also asked what type of binoculars you would recommend if you have a recommendation. Oh, I would recommend probably um, a lot of people have different opinions. Um, something that's like 10 by 50 or seven by 50, if you can find them. And that, that means that it magnifies, first number is how much it magnifies by. The second number is how wide it is with millimeters. Um, so like for instance, a 10 by 50 magnifies 10 times and it has a 50 millimeter lens. Those are pretty common type of binoculars to find. Um, and they're great because you can, um, with that kind of eyepiece, you can see a lot more stars, thousands more stars than you can see with your naked eye. You can see a lot of these, um, we call them faint fuzzies, these Messier objects. And you can also see a lot of things like, you can't see the rings of Saturn, but you can see the moon of Saturn, Titan, and you can see the moons of Jupiter every night, the four moons of Jupiter. Thanks. And you can see a lot of detail on the moon. We have one person with their hand raised, but I think I have one last one from chat first. Um, okay. Donna said, another fascinating talk, William, your knowledge of astronomy and cultural origins of the constellations always amazes her. And her question is, what is the name of that sphere you showed us earlier in your talk, the one on your shelf? Oh, this one here, uh, it's called an armillary sphere. Um, and this is a uh, really like a, almost like a um, Renaissance, maybe medieval object. Um, but uh, this, is not, this is not so old, this is a modern version, but it's a really cool uh, one that, um, that shows you basically um, what the sky would look like if you could go outside of the sky and look down on it. <laughs> but you can't really do that, of course. But it gives you uh, it gives you a picture of uh, of what what this guy. If you can imagine, there's like a little. Or I, I can't tell how well anyone can see this, but there's a little representation of Earth at the middle, and then the constellations of the zodiac are on this band around you. Um, and if you um, pick any particular um, zodiac constellation, like Virgo, I'm gonna try to find that. Um, you can see what will happen as the sun rises in that constellation and travels across the sky and then and sets. So. This is a, a really wonderful, cool uh, type of invention that I think the oldest ones are probably from the, the Middle Ages, I would say. But um, they, they were a, kind of a, a, a kind of planetarium that you can keep on your desk and, and just see what, what's up in the night sky on a given night. Um, so I think our, our last question here is, uh, Kim, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. You should be able to unmute and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, good evening. I came in late, darn it. But anyway, I wanted to ask, um, I have a lot of trees in my yard too. And does the instructor, does he ever go out and have groups to come out with their telescopes? I just got, well, I didn't just get it, but um, I have an Orion 80, I think, uh, um, beginners. And all I can see so far is the moon. <laughs> but I'd like to get with a group or something where I can come out with mine and, and know what I'm... It, looking at that's the first question and then the second one is um what's coming up soon that i can kind of look for okay 
Yeah, in response to the first question, uh, we, we did a lot of these in the past, these group events, and they're really great. We've put a pause on it because of COVID, um, but we, we're hoping in, in the future to be able to start this up again, maybe next year. So just keep in touch with our observatory about uh, the next in-person event that we can do. Oh, okay. um, but um, in regards to your second question, I think you said you came a little bit late. So what I mentioned right at the beginning is a lunar eclipse. Um, so I don't remember exactly when I said that was going to be, but I think November. In November? Like, okay. November. <laughs> and maybe November 19. And I might be wrong about that now, unless I, unless I go back to my notes. But um, let me double check that for you because I want to give you accurate information. November 19, 2021, there will be a lunar eclipse. Okay. It'll be a really cool event tomorrow. And um, I would uh, definitely recommend uh, keeping your eyes on, that'll be the night of the full moon. The usual full moon uh, is always the same night as a lunar eclipse, but that night the moon will enter Earth's shadow. Um, so over the course of the night, it will start getting dimmer and dimmer. And then it, when it enters the really, really deep part of Earth's shadow, it will start turning red, and very spooky looking. Um, so it's uh, it's a partial lunar eclipse, but it's almost total. So it's just as almost as good as a total eclipse, pretty much. And it's safe to look at. It's not like the the um, solar one. It's you can look at that through the microscope. I mean, through the uh, telescope, right? Yeah, it's totally safe to look at the moon at nighttime. Um, the the sun is the only dangerous thing to look at in the sky. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, as long as you're doing it at nighttime, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, the uh, the moon is uh, really bright sometimes when it's a full moon, but it's not it's not going to damage your eyes for sure. But during a full moon, it becomes very very dark. So you can look at it. I encourage you to look at it through a telescope. It's really cool. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was the last question I had um, here. So mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks. Uh, someone did ask, though, I'm not sure if you know, or if Donna uh, can let me know in chat where the recording will live if someone wants to watch this. Yeah, so we have a um, YouTube channel. Okay. And um, um, off the top of my head, I, I don't remember exactly the name of the channel, but we can probably send that out in some way. It's um. If you look up Hamptons Observatory YouTube, we have it. Okay, so yeah, I'll send. Okay, so I'll send that to everybody. So, <laughs> don't worry, you guys will get it. <laughs> Great. Okay, so thank you so much. I'm getting a bunch of things in the chat to me about how uh, much everyone enjoyed this. So thank, thank you so much, much for everyone for coming <laughs> out. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you have any. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me or Donna, the executive director of the observatory, and I'll try to answer your question by email. And I also just added the link to um, your uh, next event. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I just sent it to one person. I'm sorry, Julia. I keep doing this. I sent something to one person instead of everyone. I just did it again. I don't know what's happening. But um, there we go. That went to everyone. Sorry, everyone. I've accidentally messaged. Um, <laughs> So thank you so much, William and Donna. I'm so happy that you came and reached out to us at the library to do this. Thank you so much, Ariel. This is wonderful. And thank you for all your help. And <laughs> Okay, that's it. So good night, everybody. Okay. Night, everyone. Just go stargazing. Yep. <laughs>